Okay, good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, this is the first of a series of webinars for Tree Week 2023. Um, and Aina Nilauna is going to give a talk on biodiversity starts with forests. Just to mention, there will be uh, Cormac Downey is giving a webinar tomorrow, and the Augustin Henry lecture traditionally occurs on the Thursday of Tree Week is in the uh, Botanic Gardens on Thursday. So anyway, Aina is going to talk about the, I suppose our slogan for Tree Week is biodiversity begins with forests. Aina came up with the slogan, so I suppose um, we brought her here now to tell us all about it. Uh, Aina is the current president of the Tree Council of Ireland and uh, is coming near the end of her reign. So. Um, over to you, Aina. Thank you very much, Brendan. It's great mm. to be. I, I, I don't know whether it is great or not to be still doing these things on Zoom. You know, you do this because COVID is there and you can't appear in the person. So now we end up appearing in the person and doing things on Zoom. So it's great that the Zoom has lasted because it means we can get the message out to a larger audience at different times. So the, the actual um, theme for National Tree Week this week was Biodiversity begins with trees, Brendan. Are trees and forests the same thing? This is the question. Did I say forests? Three times, but we won't dwell on that. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, in order that I will not be looking at Brendan or anybody else, I'm going to share the screen with you now, and I will talk for maybe half an hour or so about this, if I can find where I'm supposed to be going with this. Here we go. And there we are. And I presume that it... Oh, yes. I assure, I, I presume that's all That's all right now, is it, Brendan? Am I up on air? Yeah. Yeah, it looks perfect for me anyway. Yeah. 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 Okay. So biodiversity begins with trees. And, um, and I suppose it begs the question, as Brendan was saying, begins with forests. Are, in fact, trees and forests the same thing? And um, I'll come to that as I move on through my talk. But I suppose like any, like any, good, like any good talk that you might be given, if I could get this thing to work now, Yes, we, we have to talk about what biodiversity is in the first instance. So, you know, what is the definition of biodiversity? And we've always known that it's actually the huge variety that there is in living things. So when we talk about biodiversity, we talk about lots of different species, lots of different habitats where these species may live, and lots of genetic variation even within a species. So these are the three aspects of biodiversity. And I'll quickly run over some examples of these so that you can see what I mean. So if we start off, say, with lots of different species, we're talking about things like lots of birds. We're looking here at a lovely picture of a thrush. This is a, a, a female thrush who is a um, song thrush, who is obviously feeding young because otherwise she would have gobbled up the worm herself. So obviously she's bringing it back, so she's breeding. So this this is, is is two biodiversities, I suppose. In one, we have the thrush and we have the worm. We have other, another mammal then, the fox. We have lots of these in Ireland, lots of these in Dublin, and in urban areas in particular. They have adjusted very well to living with humans. So they are part of our biodiversity as well. So I'm just taking an example of each of the groups rather than going through, I mean, in many many species of mammals and many species of things do we have in Ireland, but I'm just doing an example of each. So here we're looking at amphibians and of course this is the common frog, common at the moment, hopping around the place and um, out of hibernation, starting breeding, people rep report ponds, people report places where there's frog spawn. So the frog is doing quite well in Ireland and um, long that it may last. Insects of course are part of it as well and Looking at that now, you might say, oh, that's a wasp because it's got um, black and yellow stripes. But in actual fact, it's not a wasp. It's a pretend wasp. It's a hoverfly. Hoverflies which are taking on the same colours as the wasp in order to avoid getting eaten by predators. And it has big eyes, like flies have big eyes. Flies have short antennae. So this and the yellow legs. So this is actually not a wasp. But as, as the birds don't come to my lectures, the birds don't know that this is actually a mimic but part again of our very rich biodiversity. Then I could be doing species all day, but I mean, that's not really the theme of the talk today. So I'm looking then at habitats, places where these things occur. So if it's all the same habitat, no matter how much variety there is in that habitat, that variety is constrained by the fact that it's all the same habitat. But if we have different habitats, 
then we'll have different things in different habitats. So to have more biodiversity, no matter how good the one habitat is, more habitats give us more biodiversity. So here's a here's a nice woodland in springtime. We can see that the leaves are beginning to come on the birch trees and that the bluebells are busy growing in the light underneath because once the canopy closes, then there's less light on the woodland floor. So woodland plants in general, we get them flowering this time of year before the canopy closes, making the most of the light. So that's a birch woodland. So woodlands then will have all of the things that will occur in woodlands and they will be, as you might imagine, quite different to what you might find on a bog. Here we are looking at a piece of bog. I think it's from our DRD um, raised bog. And this is an area where it's completely different, much too wet, much too acidic for trees to grow. So quite the opposite to our woodland, plenty of light, plenty of, of um, times for plants to grow. So they don't have to flower when it's a bit cold. So they tend to flower on bogs later on in the year when they have the benefit of the rising temperature. So you're looking at a completely different habitat there. So if you have woodlands and bogs, you've got um, much more biodiversity than just a woodland by itself in the area. Then moving over to the west of Ireland, we're looking at our, our mountains over there. This is Diamond Hill, which is over near Kyle Moran County, Galway. And you can see that that's the mountain up behind. And then in the front, we have um, a row of oak woodland just in there along the background. The leaves are not on it yet, so that's why it's it's looking like that. And then in the actual front, artistically taking the picture through the branches, this is actually an ash tree. So we and then we have a lake over here between us and this oak woodland over there. So we're looking at we're looking at quite a lot of different habitat in this slide. And um, you can see then because there are different places for creatures to live. There are different creatures that will live in each of these places. What you have in the lake will be different to what you have on top of the mountain and vice versa with the woodland. And of course, even things that might be man-made will be a habitat for wildlife as well. And this is a graveyard in Ross Common. We get, it's an old graveyard. We can just see the gravestone up behind the wall here. And this wall has been here for a very long time. It's this graveyard wall. And as you can see, it has been completely covered in plants things that have grown on the wall, things that have put, put their roots into the cracks between the stones to get nutrients and nourishment. We have a bit of ivy on it, we've got moss on it, we've got ferns on it, we've got different types of ferns actually. And if you hung around long enough to stay quiet, you would see invertebrates, creepy crawlies, spiders, things like that in and out of that. And indeed, hunting birds coming, maybe or stoats, something else coming to live there. So even something that is not um, if it's man-made and that isn't there for a huge long time relative to, say, a woodland, can still be a wonderful area for biodiversity. So we're looking at generally the way one looks at biodiversity, really. You look at it from a point of view of all the different plants, animals, all the different, all the different um, habitats where these might occur. But looking at it now from another way, if, if we're having good biodiversity, we should have the whole range of things. And if we look at the rules of ecology, there's a whole, we can divide our, our living things up in a different way. So, I mean, if we start off with what makes the food, the plants, they're the primary producers. So if we don't have plants, we have nothing because all the food in the world is made by plants. They make it from the air using um, sunlight for photosynthesis. They, they break open the CO2 molecules and they save the carbon in the plant. And that carbon then is processed in the plant to be sugars to be different, more complicated sugars, starches, perhaps we can get it into oils, we can get it in things like proteins, if you're talking about nuts, and indeed um, in trees, of course, it becomes timber in the end. So all of this are done by plants. So if we have no plants, we have nothing, because we have nothing for the herbivores to eat. The herbivores are the plant-eating creatures, so we need to have those in our in our habitat as well. We have our plants, we have our herbivores, we have the carnivores then who feed on the herbivores. And of course, there's a cute whores, if, I, if you like, the, the omnivores who will depend, who can eat plants and animals. They have the digestive organs for both. They will be there as well. And top carnivores, which top carnivores are ones that need, you know, much more territory in order to feed on because there are fewer of those and they have greater requirements. So there's always fewer top carnivores. There's always fewer birds of prey than there are spiders in numbers. There's always fewer of these 
stoats than you would get of rabbits or something like that because top carnivores use a lot more energy to find their food and they have to get enough to keep them going. And then, so we, we must have all of these. And then it's all very well having all these, but if it's all, if all our energy is tied up in plants and herbivores and carnivores, there's nothing left. So we have to have the cycle continuing. We have to have it breaking down as well. So in a properly existing hab place, we have to have decomposers. We have to have the fungi. These are the living things that actually really break down the plants, break down the dead herbivores and carnivores and disentangle the nutrients back again into the soil and give off the, the carbon that was taken in by the plants. So these, in a way, are the opposites to the, to the plants. The plants take in the carbon dioxide and break it up and save the carbon as food, give off the oxygen. This lot use up oxygen in order to break down the plants that are there and they give off carbon into the atmosphere. So if your tree falls down and decomposes away, all the carbon that was saved by the tree when it was growing decomposes and goes back off into the atmosphere again. So if you like, decomposing plants do actually give off carbon into the atmosphere, but they do it obviously at a very slow rate. If you really want to do it quickly, you burn the tree and your carbon will be gone off in five minutes, whereas a decomposing situation could last 10, 15, 20 years for a thing to break down completely. And then, of course, we mustn't, of course, forget the soils as well, because soils and soil microbes are a hugely important part of our biodiversity. And depending on the quality of the soil, the depth of the soil, the richness of the soil, how many microbes are there, what lives in the soil, what bacteria are there, this will have a huge impact on, on, on the plants and therefore on the herbivores and carnivores as well. So if we're looking at biodiversity, instead of just counting the results, if you like, so many birds, this particular species, that particular fungus, um, looking at it from an overall point of view, we're looking at the, the whole ecological setup, all of the different levels at which um, life can exist. So if we could think of before humans arrived at all, all our biodiversity consisted of naturally occurring species and natural habitat. So there were no humans at all. There was no interference from humans for that point of view. So the biodiversity, I'm sure, if one could think one's mind back and think about such a matter, it was as good as it could be because the interference with it was not human caused. And humans, of course, are the ones that can really cause um, damage to biodiversity by their activities. So if we were to look at um, places that are still in existence without any human interference, we get an example of, of the same sort of thing. I'm just showing you there a woodland because, in fact, these are natural habitats. And what we have in them, in fact, are a couple of things. First of all, we have the survival of the fittest. So, you know, things get colonised, plants come along, animals, whatever. Thinking of Ireland after the last ice age, when plants and animals came back to Ireland, when the Ice Age was melting, the ice was all retreating back from southern, from the middle of Europe, going up north, and plants and animals were following it up. So they all came, but they may not all have survived. We don't know what came that didn't survive. We only see the, the positive results. We only see the winners, if you like, looking back. Other things may have arrived from southern Europe and took one look at the place and said, we don't like living here or couldn't live because it was too cold or too wet or too dry or soils weren't right or whatever. So natural habitats, when we look at them, what you're looking at is the end product, the survival of the fittest. You don't see the ones that didn't make it. You only see the ones that did. And of course, what we're looking at after a period of time is climax vegetation. So if you could go back in a helicopter or back in a time machine, nine, 10,000 years ago to Ireland when the ice was retreating. First of all, what was uncovered was whole tundra and not much soils. And it took a while for that to warm up another bit for more soils to, to, to grow, to become established on top of the bare rock for the ice age um, conditions to go away and the ground up soil, ground up rocks to become soil. And you had things like tundra vegetation, thin grasses. But as it was continuing to warm up, as it was continuing to improve, the, the, you, your vegetation continued to change. So we didn't continue and keep our, our tundra grassland, which had the whole herds of giant Irish deer on them. The climax vegetation continued and it got to what we call a climax, which was trees and then um, forests that was 
climax forest. It was a stable forest. And before human interference, in, you know, conditions would change generally very slowly. So they reckon it was perhaps 2000 years after it before um, we got our, our climax vegetation in Ireland. Now, if you look then at somewhere like the tropical rainforest in around the tropics, they had no ice ages. I mean, our, our vegetation, our, our climax vegetation is only going back 10,000 years since the end of the last ice age. But if you go right down to where the around the equator, they had no ice ages there at all. So they didn't have it all wiped out like cleaning the blackboard every 40, 50,000 years when we got another ice age and starting again. They had it there for three, four million years, a continuous vegetation that was never actually changed or wiped out or interfered with by humans or anything like that. So there was huge, and there is huge, biodiversity in these tropical rainforests because there has been a continuation of creatures living there, of conditions living there since three, four million years ago when so it ended up after continental um, movements had left our, our continents in the condition or in the positions that they are now. So huge biodiversity in tropical rainforests because they had no ice ages. But so change happened very slowly there. And I remember going at one point over to Costa Rica with the um, RTU or the few bob in those days and sent us off to make programs. And we went over to do the rainforests in Central America. And we had a guide and we, he brought us up to this place and popped out at the car park. And I went over to the first tree I saw and said, what's this? Because it was great to be away with the guide. And, you know, I didn't know anything because I hadn't been to that part of the world at all. And here we have all these different huge trees. I imagine the guy didn't know what the tree was. The tree in the car park. He said, what do you mean you don't know the tree in it in the car park? You know, thinking, I mean, couldn't he make up something? Sure, I wouldn't know whether he said the truth or not. But anyway, he pointed out to me that there were 320 different species of trees in a hectare because I was in a rainforest. And of course, Murphy's Law being what it is, I had to pick the one that he didn't actually know. And he proceeded to show me all the other 327 of them. I was sorry I asked. But it is it, it, um huge variety, and it was amazing to see this. But if change happens quickly, the balance is interrupted. I mean, this is the point. I mean, you know, if change happens slowly, but it's a different matter. But if it happens quickly, if the balance is interrupted, they can be sudden and catastrophic. Now, here's a picture taken at the time of the dinosaurs. You must remember this a mere 65 million years ago when there was a, a catastrophic change. There was this is an artist's impression of a, a meteorite striking the earth and wiping it out and there was a huge catastrophic change all was wiped out completely it took actually it took millions of years to get back to the situation i mean this was 65 million years ago and there were millions and millions of years after that as the world repopulated re, you know got new plants got new animals got going but stability returns when change slows down so that's fine, but change actually never stops. We never, the world never stops changing. Now, it, in it may be, it may be infinitesimally slowly. I mean, continents are still moving. Continents moving is not something that happened long ago. I mean, continents are still moving at the same rate as your fingernails grow. And as I'm sure everybody knows, who ever broke a fingernail, that's very slow indeed. So that's the speed at which the continents move. But it continues to happen, and over millions of years, we know. Our continents move from warm places to cold places. We know that, in fact, tomorrow in the Botanic Gardens, if I could get up to have a look, if I listen, they have a lecture on the forests that are under the ice, under the ground, in the rocks in Antarctica, showing us that Antarctica was never always over the South Pole and a frozen continent. It drifted there from somewhere else, warmer, carrying its forests, which quickly weren't able to survive in those cold areas, but the remains of them are still there. So continents move and that affects what happens to the creatures and animals there. Climate change happens, as we know. Climate change has always happened. Climates have changed from warm to cold, from wet to dry. And this, of course, then affects the animals and plants that are there. But they adapt because if, if, if change happens slowly, there's time to adapt. Until the present era of the Anthropocene, as they call it now, but long ago when climate change happened, it happened exceedingly slowly over a long period of time. I mean, when we talk about burning fossil fuels and all the carbon that's in that coal and oil being put back into the atmosphere, I mean, that carbon, that, that carbon was in the atmosphere 
but it was taken in by the plants that became the coal, became the oil because of environmental conditions. But they didn't just grow up one fine day and suck it all in over 100 years. I mean, it took millions of years for those plants to grow, take in the carbon and then not decompose because of the climatic, because of the soil conditions or the whatever way they, they were retained. And as a consequence, the carbon that they took in was held on to. It wasn't let back off into the atmosphere the way if a tree falls down and not the way it goes back anyway. It, the conditions where those things fell down were such that the carbon that from the atmosphere was held on to. But it happened over millions of years. And what we're doing in effect now is releasing all that carbon back in the period of 100 years, which is a very, very fast period of time when we're talking about how stability is, is affected when change hurries up. So some animals can adapt if it's slow. Evolution can happen because that's what, ever, that's what causes evolution, in fact, is conditions changing in the environment. So if there was no environmental change, there would be no evolution. It's not what they say about sharks in the sea. The sharks in the sea are the same as they were millions of years ago because the conditions for the oceans for the sharks haven't changed. So if it ain't broke, why would you fix it? So why would your sharks evolve? Whereas if, it, if conditions are changing slowly, plants and animals that are able to cope with this are the ones that will leave the most offspring and they will adapt. But the biggest change, of course, was maybe what three quarters of a million years ago when humans happened, because humans were the, were the one species that began to affect all the others. And really, it's, it's, it's looking at this that we're talking about when we talk about biodiversity nowadays, because biodiversity has always been the thing. It's always been there, but it's the impact of humans on biodiversity that's causing us to, to be concerned. I mean, all the changes caused by humans can be on a very fast scale indeed. Now, I hope nobody watching this, that this is their house, but, you know, I mean, this is def definitely a scorched earth policy. Here's a new house in a rural area, and this is the road. There isn't even the hedge left. Never mind anything else. Perhaps they're saying you need sight lines. But I mean, how much biodiversity is there now? I happened on this and took the picture. I was only sorry I hadn't been there maybe 10 years earlier and got the picture before the house was built and had a look at the same site. So, you know, changes can be on a very fast scale like this, but it can be on a slower scale too, because we are affecting um, biodiversity with, with, with various, various things that we do. Habitat destruction, removing keystone species, introducing invasive species, and by introducing, in fact, and creating genetically modified organisms. So I'm coming to, I'm coming to, I haven't forgotten that biodiversity begins with trees, I'm building up to it. So let's have a look and see how we are affecting biodiversity by these methods. This is a raised bog, and a raised bog, as you know, in Ireland was a lake after the last ice age, in the middle of good land, perhaps, and because it was a lake with no drainage, it was sort of a low lying place. It filled up with, with vegetation over a couple of thousand years and we got a raised bog because it was up over the countryside. So this was a raised bog. And of course, all of these stripes then are showing us that these are the areas where the extraction of peat was, was happening for people to use as fuel over the centuries. All of these stripes tell us that these are particular areas owned by different families and groups who needed the peat for for actually heating and for, for fuel. And then at the middle there, we have the wee bit that's left, this bit up at the very top, that hasn't been removed, it hasn't been taken away. And this is still um, a raised bog, although much reduced because obviously to take out all of this peat, you had to drain the bog and take a lot of water out of it. So it wouldn't be raised anymore. When it was there originally, it was like a big hill. It might've been 15 meters high at the top. You could see over the countryside. But having taken all the water out in order to, drain, to um, take the turf from around here, it has reduced it somewhat. In fact, if you look at it like this, you can see it on the ground and you can see all the vegetation has been taken off this particular bit and it's just the, the peat being extracted. So, I mean, that certainly is habitat destruction. And we're back into the woodlands around the edges where there's no peat because raised bogs, there's no, they're, they're not blanket bogs. It's either woodland or you have peat. Just, so if you take away all the peat, you still have the good land. So you have this, this sharp um, junction, if you like, between one and the other. So raised bogs in particular have suffered a lot in Ireland because of the abundance of peat there and the accessibility of it. And over the centuries, people needed fuel for their fires. And so this is why they were extracted. Nowadays, we're trying to protect what's left of our raised bogs. 
agriculture, of course, has had a huge impact on, on habitat reduction as well. Uh, you can see here now this these are fields with their hedgerows and whatever has been growing in those. But this person here now has decided that their field is not big enough at all. So we can see kind of the places where the hedges had been from other fields, but they've all been removed. It looks like a like a quilt on a bed or something with pillow and blankets. But these are the machinery going around harvesting the wheat. Now this is not America, this is Ireland. This is one of the big fields they use for or I don't know, sometimes they have them for ploughing championships or the like, that's not that particular one. But this is this is a field in Ireland where the actual um, thing has been entirely removed for agriculture. So the huge amount of habitat destruction to, to get your field like that, to put in one crop, to put in um, something that you want for a crop and you don't want anything else. So not only are you just planting something, which are probably waging war on in the insects and things that might destroy the crop on you. So very much an area where there's very little biodiversity because of human activity. Now, keystone species are something that I want to talk about as well. I mean, I could talk about habitat destruction all day, but I'm just I'm just bringing these things to mind one at a time. So, a keystone keystone species impact whole habitats. Now, in Ireland, wolves were the top predators. They were the keystone species. And they fed on deer. I mean, these are top carnivores. They fed on herbivores. They, 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 only, they only ate meat. They didn't have jam sandwiches or anything like that. They wouldn't eat grass. So they fed on deer, kept numbers under control. And of course, now that we removed our wolves, these uncontrolled deer have a huge impact on our trees and on our forestry. So we did have wolves in Ireland up to 1780. The last wolf was killed in the Blackstairs Mountain, and there's, a, there's actually a stone in, in, in Fina, in the little village of Fina, where, where it says, with a little wolf on it, showing that this was where the hounds of Major Dalton came from, the ones that demolished the last wolf. So these were wolves, Mokchiras, Brefi, Steelcoos. There's different place names still called after, after wolves. Brefi and Mayo, that's an old name for a wolf, as is Feltrim Hill in Dublin. That's, that's another name, Whalecoo, for a wolf. So we had wolves there and they were top predators and they fed on deer. Now, in the days when we had the wolves, our deer were mainly, um, in fact, were, were, in a, were in actual fact, um, red deer and perhaps some of these ones as well. These are the fallow deer. These were introduced by the Normans as, as a hunt for hunting for sport. And they kept them generally in deer parks, which would be very large areas. I mean, the Phoenix Park is where we think of a particular land of them. but they were in other parks around the country and they were used, you know, they, were, they, were, they were hunted by, by Normans. But the native ones were the, were the um, red deer and the wolves kept manners on them. The wolves would hunt them in packs and keep the numbers down to a manageable, a manageable number. So we never thought or saw our woodlands being affected by, by deer in, in, in those days. I mean, these are the other ones here. Now, these are the, the Sika deer. Sika deer were introduced into Ireland by Lord Powers Court in the 1840s. And not only did he bring over Sika deer from Japan in his travels, he decided it would be a great idea if he crossed them with the native bread because they were, they were genetically related. And he succeeded in doing this. He succeeded in having fertile offspring. And they did better than either of their parents. And an awful lot of the deer all around the country are actually Sika red crosses rather than true native red deer or true blue Sika deer either. And they have run amok. We do not have any wolves left over to actually put manners on them. We got rid of the wolves. And as a consequence, the deer can reproduce. They have a situation where you have one male and all the females, you have this rutting. This is where the idea of stag parties come from, I suppose. But the winner takes all. So you have you have um, all the females covered by the, the big strong stag and each one has a, has a fawn every year. And herbivores and they they feed on trees they feed on the barks of trees tree damage is caused by them they they feed even more significantly even worse on seedlings which are smaller and juicier so we have deer all around the place and if they come into an area where there's trees or there's woodland it is christmas and their birthday and they succeed in removing any growing trees that are happening so reproduction of trees from seedlings doesn't happen in an area where there are deer. And where are the deer? The deer are everywhere. So it's really very difficult in a wooded area for natural regeneration to take place because of the amount of deer that we have with no natural predators for them. 
and indeed they will damage the actual trees themselves as well as stopping new ones from growing. And then goats can be even worse. Now we don't have a huge amount of Irish wild goats, but we do have herds of them in different parts of the west of Ireland. And also they are browsers too. So they will equally eat trees and leaves and seedlings and herds of them are in Kerry, they're in Burren, they're in Mayo, and in, certainly in Kerry where we would have a lot of woodlands, damage can be caused by sheep, by, by goats as well. And then of course we have our sheep, our farming, our farmers have sheep, and sheep will, will actually add, add to the grazing pressures as well too. So without our keystone species, there's no manners on these herbivores that would be the normal prey of the wolves. Now, this is not to say that I am agreeing with him and Ryan that we should immediately go over and bring over a few wolves. Because the thing is, bringing wolves back to Ireland now, we're not bringing them back to a country that they left way back in the end of the 1600s, 1700s, where it was much more wooded and there was much less agriculture. We have something like three and a half million sheep. If you were a wolf, would you bother running after the smelly old goat or would you bother trying to catch a deer? There was a nice whole field of sheep sitting nearby. And the countryside is not actually able or designed or evolved now to, to bring back a top predator like that willy nilly into a place because of our intensive agriculture at the moment. What I'm doing, what I'm doing saying today is explaining to you how by removing your, your keystone predator, you have caused an, you know, an implosion or an explosion of the amount of the herbivores. And this has problems with trees. Grey squirrels do their shares too. Grey squirrel, as you know, are an invasive species brought in in 1911 and they spread all it down along the eastern side of the country. And you know, they, they, of course, don't hibernate. They're out the whole time. They eat nuts, as every child will tell you. But they eat no nuts the whole year round. I mean, they don't be eating nuts in July and August when there aren't any. And did anyone ever think, what do they eat then? And we all know very well what they eat then. They, they, they eat the bark of trees. They, they cause huge amounts of damage to trees. I mean, in the Phoenix Park, where we have lots of grey squirrels, you know, by the time the trees get to 15 years of age, they're suffering hugely from squirrel damage. Trees are big enough for the squirrels to climb up and, and bite them and eat them. Now, mind you, the red squirrels would do that as well. But we have fewer red squirrels and they're, they're smaller squirrels as well, too. They don't have such huge appetites as, as the grey squirrels do. Now, the predator on the grey squirrels is, turns out to be, in fact, the pine martin. And the pine martins have begun to recover. The red squirrels know that the pine martens are their enemies. They have a, a, a tribal memory, if you like, but the greys have no notion that this is the case because they're an American species. They have no wariness of pine martens. So pine martens, in fact, are beginning to put manners on the grey squirrels. So we're seeing an imbalance again, if you like, evolution happening, if you like, to a certain extent, where, where they, they, they're bedding in. They're here for 100 years now and the situation they're finding themselves in with your pine martens is not proving to be suitable for them. But I don't think anyone in Ireland is crying about that. And then, of course, we have invasive species, and they, of course, can reduce biodiversity as well. We have things like Himalayan balsam on the riverbanks and rhododendron in the woodlands. And here's your, your Himalayan balsam. And this was brought in at one point, I think, because the flowers are beloved of bees, and bees make honey and stuff for them. Isn't that great? But the trouble with the Himalayan balsam is that it grows so well and so densely that everything else is pushed out of the way. And of course, it grows very well along the banks of rivers, pushing everything else out, getting great stands of this. But it's the one that dies back completely in the wintertime and grows every year from new seeds. And in the wintertime, when it's all died back, it's bare soil because it's pushed everything out when it was growing. You have a bare bank, it tends to rain in Ireland in the winter sometimes, rivers rise and they wash away the banks. You have huge amounts of erosion from the rivers washing away the bare banks and all of this silt and stuff getting into the rivers affecting the gills of fish all because banks were left bare because of great stands of Himalayan balsam. And rhododendron is an absolute scourge because here we're looking at a woodland and you can see the trees and this is the time of year when this is now taken in May when our rhododendron ponticum is in flower and you can see how it's all over the place. So what has happened really, if you think about it, you have your oak woodland, you have your deer, goats grazing underneath, absolutely no um, 
growth from new trees because the seedlings are being gobbled up. And then this invasive species was brought in and has spread throughout. It's an evergreen species. It has leaves in the winter time. It's quite warm in Ireland. It can grow in the winter time. So it has taken over underneath the woods. Now it hasn't pushed out the oak trees, but an oak tree will never grow here again unless the rhododendron goes away, because when the acorns fall down, there's no light for the seedlings to grow. And if it did, it could be gobbled up by a goat. So we have we have this awful predicament in our native woodlands. And there's a lot of this rhododendron all along the areas, anywhere where the soil is acidic enough for, for rhododendron to grow. We see it all along the west of Ireland now, growing in areas where there are trees. And because of the fact that and the undergrowth was gone because of the grazing animals. There was nothing to stop the rhododendron coming in and, and making its own of it. And of course, rhododendron is, it establishes for no undergrowth remains because of grazing and it stops regeneration of new seedlings. And of course, it's useful itself for biodiversity. I mean, it, it, it's useless. It comes from, from Turkey, but it came as seedlings, it came as plants. So I presume there's things over in Turkey that can grow and eat and do whatever, but none of those useful biodiversity came with it. So the flowers and the leaves and the nectar, they contain diterpenes. And diterpenes are kind of toxic chemicals, which are actually toxic to wildlife. So a lot won't eat it. If you eat some of these, you'll die if you're a caterpillar or a creepy crawly. And the, the, the honeybees will visit it and they make, sometimes they make honey. But that honey is actually poisonous to humans. So you don't want your bees to go near rhododendron because it, the, the terpenes in the rhododendron honey is poisonous. Now, honeybees don't, don't make honey from it, and beekeepers are very careful to make sure that doesn't happen. But it's an awful affliction. Not only has it no biodiversity of its own, but it actually damages and kills the biodiversity that we do have here because it's a Johnny Come Lately species on the evolutionary scale of things. And creatures and stuff that we have in Ireland have no defence against it yet at all. It's not that long in Ireland, under 200 years, which is nothing on an evolutionary scale. And then, of course, diseases are going to affect affect um, biodiversity as well. And I'm just looking down here. This is an elm tree and Dutch elm disease um, caused by beetles ca carrying a fungus caused these things to die back from lack of water getting up to the top. And we only probably realised how many elms we had all around the country when we saw them all dead, sticking up in hedgerows and places like that. And this thing still exists and it's carried around still. And if you have an elm tree for 15 or 20 years of age, it'll get this disease back again. This is the ash tree now, and ash trees are suffering from ash dieback, which is a sort of a fungal disease that's blown on the wind. And this is decimating these two. So these both canopy trees, very large canopy trees and good soils, these were affected by diseases brought in. And this is where, when you talk about um, genetic variation, it's really important. Because the hope is that there may be some ash trees that are actually resistant to this particular disease. Because if you have a lot of genetic biodiversity, each tree is not a clone of each other. So some of them, I mean, because ash trees are actually native species, they spread into Ireland after the end of the last ice age. Naturally, they came little by little until they got covered Ireland. But they didn't come from one, just one introduction of one seedling so that they're all the same. Like the grey squirrels, they only came once in the basket to a wedding and all our grey squirrels are genetically clones practically. But if you have enough biodiversity, some of these things will be resistant to whatever disease or whatever thing throws at it. And this gives us an opportunity not to become extinct. Whereas if you have genetically engineered things or if there's only one introduction and everything comes from that, one horse chestnut introduced into Ireland and everything from that, the seeds all the same. There's no variety then to act as a resistance to diseases that come along because well, the, the actual trees are all the same. The disease affects them and this is what happens. So your genetic variation is very important for biodiversity. So non-invasive introductions then, we have those as well. I mean, this we're looking here now at a beech tree. This is a beech woodland. The beech, beech came in with the Normans. I mean, Lord, the, 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 the Normans are, are alleged to have brought in the first beech trees, but they certainly were well here around 1500. 
and lots and lots of, uh, of forests with beech. Interesting, though, because beech, beech throws such a shade that really there's very little ivy ever grows on beech trees. So less biodiversity in the beech woodland, huge, huge amounts of shade. Whereas if you look at, say, uh, something like an ash tree or an oak tree, here's your, your ivy growing right up the tree. And contrary to what people might think, ivy doesn't kill trees at all. Ivy is a, is a native plant growing up on this surface. And here you have areas for biodiversity for creepy crawlies, for invertebrates, for robins to build nests, you get it up a bit higher, more light, you have berries, you have flowers, you have flowers for bees and they make honey from ivy and it is delicious honey, it's not a bit poisonous like the old, the old rhododendron stuff that we wouldn't be touching and you have berries on these as well which are around to feed the birds and later in, later in the winter, spring, sort of early February you get the berries on these. So and it's only in the end of the tree's life with the big canopy of ivy on it that it's more resistant to wind throw than one that doesn't have and it might fall over earlier but it hasn't been killed by the ivy. Ivy is able to make its own food, it doesn't suck nutrients out of it, it's not a thing like a strangler pig you might get in the rainforest but as I said the ivy grows on our native trees very well but it doesn't grow so much on evergreens. I mean here's a, a woodland, a planted woodland of conifers and again with lack of light getting in through it you have very little by way of things growing on the ground. The earlier picture I showed you with the bluebells, there was light getting through into the woodland in the in the before the leaves came back on the trees in spring, giving us all this woodland flora. But when we have our conifers like this, the leaves don't ever, these are evergreen trees, the leaves don't fall off, the light doesn't get through, and we don't have we don't have that biodiversity at all. Now, I mean a lot of these conifers were planted as um crops for, for um, the wood the wood and the timber industry and we get a huge amount of employment in rural areas from cutting down trees for using the timber from sawmills and we need our timbers for, for, for building and in fact if you build a house with timber roof on it the carbon that was taken in by the trees stays in your house it doesn't decompose and go back up into the atmosphere it's it's chalk and cheese it's, it's, it's apples and oranges I mean woodlands like this have a different purpose they're, they're they're an industrial crop if you like they actually have a huge role to play in taking carbon out of the atmosphere but if we just look at it through the biodiversity lens biodiversity doesn't begin with these trees well what so then what does it do if biodiversity begins with trees what i'm talking about then is a tree itself and the biodiversity associated with a particular tree and then a whole collection of trees which is in fact a woodland so if you start off as Good trees for biodiversity in the first place, native trees that are very much good for, for insects and creepy crawlies and stuff and have a whole collection of them in a woodland, then, then now we're talking. So I was just looking at the statistics for that. Now, I don't intend, I don't expect anyone to, to read all of this. But if we look at a hawthorn tree, which is one of our native species, just down at the bottom there, you can see hawthorn supports 149 different insects species in Ireland and it tells you all the stuff it does. Blackthorn has, is a home for 109 insect species. Now insects are insects. We also have spiders which aren't insects and wood lice and so invertebrates are an even bigger collection. So this is only looking at the insects, not even at all of the others. And it talks about um, the fruit of them, lots of animals, wood mice, finches, foxes, as well as your insects. Looking at the oak, the oak is a large tree growing up to 40 meters. And it, can, it, it will support 284 different insect species. Lichens can grow on it. It can give live for a huge long time. So huge amounts of biodiversity in an oak tree. Willow, willow snow slouch either. It's got 266 different insect species with it. And of course, in springtime, when it has the catkins, the bees can feed on the pollen, take it back and use it for their young. And then moving on to other native trees, we have ash which has 41 and lots of lichens on it. We have rowan, which has 28 different insect species, birch, 229, hazel, which has 73 insect species, wild cherry and crab apple. All of these native species of trees individually can support this amount on, you know, on a good day when everything is going well. These people doing research have found, if you study enough ash trees, 41 different native insects. So if you could only plant one tree, you'd plant something like this and you would end up with a very much more biodiverse specimen than something that isn't in this league, like, like a Japanese cherry, but we won't go there. 
they're called Japan and they have flowers on the end of story. Now, so then where would you plant your trees? You could plant your trees in a completely new area for planting a collection of them. You could plant one tree, like you're asking people to do a national tree, we've been giving out trees for that. So people can go and collect, plant a few of them. But if you're planting them in a whole new area in a field, if you like, that's called afforestation where there were none before. And you, all of these trees, which have big biodiversity associated with them, put a few different species together and you're augmenting that. So you're afforestation in a new area with native trees like this, you're starting off well. But the stuff has to know that they're there. I mean, if you plant an ash tree or you plant an oak tree, a little twig, there's no biodiversity. I mean, I'm going around with them in pots, planting them, and there's no biodiversity associated with it. We dig a hole, we stick in the thick, it grow. So the, the, the creepy crawlies, the, the biodiversity has to sort of really send out emails to me and say, there's a tree over there, let's go and have a look at it. It takes a while for it to happen. But if you can put it around an existing woodland, where the woodland is there already with the stuff and you actually make it bigger. This is even better still. And this is what was done in the Millennium Forest way back in um, the year 2000 when we were planting trees for, for the Millennium. They were put around existing woodland. So the biodiversity that was there already spread out into it. So that was better still. And of course, then if you really want to, really want to have the show on the road, you fence it off from grazers. So that's what the people do who are doing the rewilding. They don't actually plant trees at all in places where they have a woodland to begin with. They actually go the whole hog. They fence it off from the grazers. And because the grazers are gone, because they have no invasive species or they remove the invasive species, this is what you get. And this is what this rewilding is about, taking an area where there was a woodland and stopping the de degradation of it. By, by grazers that shouldn't be there because there's no keystone species, by invasive species that shouldn't be there because they shouldn't have arrived, and just fencing it off. And people like um, Richard Nairn and Wicklow or Wondal Toon and Kerry have been doing this and writing books about it and saying, saying how successful it is. But you can see you could build it up. Biodiversity begins with the trees because the trees are the native temperate forest trees that we had, native vegetation we had in Ireland before people ever came. We had other things like bogs and, and poorer soils, but the main part of Ireland was covered in forests with all the attendant biodiversity in that. So that is what we need to get back to in Ireland if we really want biodiversity, because that was what was here in the first place. That's what's doing well. So that's that's the the um to what is to be aspired to. But planting a tree, planting a tree that's good for biodiversity is something a lot of us can actually do, and indeed tree council can do for you if you don't have space to do it for yourself. We have a tree plant scheme. But that's that's a way of doing it whatever small amount we can do. That is the most the most significant thing to plant a tree because it begins with trees, whether they're individuals in your garden or a collection of them in a woodland forest, it, it is where we need to go for biodiversity. So I think that's the lot. So as I said, Ireland temperate is our so it's here the most biodiversity can be found. And biodiversity then does truly begin with trees. So thank you all very much for your attention. I'm sure you're all riveted. So thank you. if you have questions there you'd like to ask, I would be delighted to take them. Okay, Ina, thank you very much for that. Um, there's been just one or two questions here indeed. Uh, the first one was about the wolves that you said we shouldn't introduce, but um, basically we have two problems. <laughs> The, the 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 fields, you know, like the ones you you show cleared and all the rest of it. In other words, we, we've cleared the fields, and that's now the reason we can't introduce the wolf to control things that are damaging the few remaining woods. Is is that true? Well, I mean, yeah, I suppose in a word it is. We've cleared the fields, and we are growing grass which has cows in it. I mean, we could have cleared the fields and be growing crops of wheat and barley. You know, I mean, it depends what you put in the fields. As it happens in Ireland, it's grazing animals. And that's because we have nine million cattle and we have three and a half million sheep. That is why we can't introduce wolves who would not be so obliging as go off and eat deer and not eat anything else, because that's the kind of farming we do. So they have, they, we have changed our environment to such an extent, like you need a place fenced off the size of County Leitrim or someplace, not picking on Leitrim particularly, but the size of a county, completely wild with the fence around it and put your wolves in there and there would be enough wildlife to sustain them. But you'd need that amount of space to put in wolves. I mean, they were, they were able to bring them back in Keystone 
in, in the Yellowstone Park in America, for example, or in some of the woodlands in Europe, because they had enough space that wasn't intensively farmed. But in Ireland, we have so much intensive farming all around the country and so much dependence on animals for farming that it isn't really a going concern at the moment. Okay, uh, next question here is about the pine marten. Pine marten was always extinct in the 1960s in Ireland, and uh, he's recently obviously got the reputation for doing in the red squirrel, the grey squirrel, and allowing the, the red squirrel to come back, which actually is in big contrast, I must say, with happened in England, where the grey squirrel now is almost the only species of squirrel left. But uh, it said that they... They uh, recovered because of the pine plantations in the 50s, I suppose, Bruce, as well, in the 50s and 60s. Well, I mean, they're, they're a woodland species. When we removed our woodlands, we, we reduced ourselves down to hedgerows. And a lot of our woodland birds that we think of as garden birds, like robins and blackbirds and things, they were all woodland birds. But they were able to slum it in the hedgerows. They didn't mind. But things like squirrels and pine martens weren't lowering themselves to live in a hedge. So they became very much reduced. So the grey squirrel, um, when it came in in 1911, came in as, as an introduction. But the amount of red squirrels at that stage had already been reduced and the pine martens because of the reduction of our woodland. I mean, in 1904, I mean, we were down to 1% or some very small amount, as John McLaughlin was telling us at the weekend in the Botanic Gardens. So, I mean, the, the grey squirrels were, were, were ground feeders, so they, they weren't so much depending on trees as the red squirrels were, and they were able to, to advance. And then, of course, the, the plantations of um, different conifers that were planted then after that were places they could hide and shelter, they can climb up trees and that. So I'm sure they did very much add to the numbers of, of um, grey squirrels that were able to expand from that. But the pine martens have, have, have recovered their numbers and as I said, there, there, there's research being done over in Sligo IT, people examining pine martin droppings and seeing that it's all grey squirrel they're eating, not red squirrel. So it's not just um, a folktale, the scientific evidence to prove that this is actually happening. OK, uh, this was in response to your, your, your field, you know, the one that showed you said it was in Ireland where everything was cleared and the pesticides and chemicals and all. Why are there so many controls at the moment on planting trees of all types uh, when there seem to be no controls on uh, destroying the environment if you're farming? Well, no, you'd want to ask You're not responsible for the policy, but yeah. Well, I give a political answer, you'd want to ask the minister that. But um, yeah, that's the result of lobbying over the years and the value that's put on things. And um, Planting trees is something that we're all aspiring to do, and the more we do of that, the better. And farmers in particular are, you know, they, they, they have to make a living from the land, and they're not there to destroy the world they live in. And they are very much willing to, to, to do things to improve the environment they're in, but they can't do it at the expense of their pocket. Would you or would any of us do things that made us poorer just for the good of all? So in a way... Farmers should be, and sometimes with these new schemes coming in, they are being rewarded for farming less intensively, for planting up corners, for, for having a high value farming methods. And more of those are needed because that's the way we, we can't expect farmers to take a hit and be poor because the rest of us think there should be trees in the place. It has to be, it has to be policy and there has to be a, a, a right of living given to farmers as well if, if they own the land. OK, another one on reintroductions. Should we reintroduce wild boar? Because uh, good and all as briars and um, ivy and uh, I don't know, rhododendrons wrote it in, they're good for anything. But uh, wild boar, you know, would, would actually control the, the, the way these things take over woodlands and all the rest of it. So why don't we reintroduce them? Well, apparently they have already escaped into the wild in some of the Wicklow woodlands, in fact. Um, they've been brought in to be farmed for, for people who want to eat wild boar in restaurants and have escaped into the wild. Um, th th we, th it was said that we had we had um, wild boar in Ireland. The Irish word for boar is Turk, and the man Turks and, you know, mountains and places called it with Turk in the name, Minish Turk refers to this, but I think research has shown that they're only wild pigs, not the real, real wild boars that they have. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to reintroduce something and then you're counting the cost of it afterwards. 
But certainly they root up with their tusks, they root up the soil, they, 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 they are um, they're carnivores and herbivores, they're omnivores. So they, they certainly are a keystone species. But um, I, I'd be loath to sort of say, yes, go for it. We've been some kind of perhaps controlled introduction to see the impact might be worth doing, perhaps in a place you could manage that. Okay, um, there's a lot more questions on reintroductions, but uh, I suppose the, the one here would be in relation to native species. Uh, beekeepers love lime trees. Sycamore has been here for a thousand years. I think you spoke about beech uh, and you had a thing on the species, you know, the number of insects that support, amazingly, ash 41 and oak 400 and something. But uh, I suppose the, the first thing was um, why... Is that a reason to exclude things like lime and sycamore from our, you know, planting programs? What, what, what does that achieve? Well, now I think whoever asked that question really, really must come to tomorrow's webinar with Cormac, Cormac Downey, who's our vice president, because obviously, in a world where climate is changing, where conditions are changing, where we have twenty-eight native species, of which the elm has got the wallop, of which ash is suffering as well. We have to look at species that would have gotten here in olden times if we had been joined to the continent of Europe long enough. So, you know, there, there should not be um, a witch hunt against things like lime and a witch hunt against things like like um, sycamore, perhaps. But um, the policy has always been because of the greater biodiversity associated with native species, they're the ones that are officially planted. But certainly beech is planted in quite a lot of places mm -hmm. and it's an introduction, if you like, albeit a thousand years ago. And similarly, you know, a lot of states have wonderful, wonderful um, stands and avenues of lime and sycamore and um, not so much sycamore, yeah. chest like that. So, I mean, there's, there's certainly a place for them. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I think the point we made probably was the ash, you know, the oak 400, whatever, the ash at only 41, and it's the absolute ultimate native, unfortunately, was hit. If lime supports 42, uh, you know, species, then should it not be added automatically to the uh, to the list of acceptable species because it's more important for biodiversity than ash, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, I'm not in charge of the planting policy of, of creature or the planting policy of the government, but I mean, they plant for other reasons than than by than biodiversity anyway in places like this. So um, it's certainly a consideration. And I mean, with, with climate changing, I mean, people are, are very, I mean, the fact that Ireland is such a good country for growing trees because of our, our, our temperate climate and our good enough soils, um, it's, it's certainly a consideration. There's, also, there's nobody that says you can't, you can't plant lime, you can't plant lime. It's a matter of getting grants to plant them in a the forestry is probably yeah. what you're referring to. It well, I suppose a lime won't contribute to solving the Hurley issue either, so far as I know. But, um, okay, or we, unless somebody else has a late question, that's more or less it. As I say, the rest of them are in the same vein. Uh, wolves seem to be a favourite topic to introduce. Um, yeah, well, probably because not only will they eat the sheep, they might eat the farmers as well. Well, there's no fairy, that's only fairy stories. Apparently, they haven't eaten very many people. It's just one of these yeah. European fairy stories. But no, I, think I, it was... I did not say introduce the wolves. I explained what happened when they were taken away. But that doesn't mean bring them back because it's a different country now than it was in the 1600s. But mm -hmm. the enemy chasta gone, I mean, the enemy chasta gone, wolves gone, whale coat. Yeah. Anyway, it, it looks like it looks like our grazing and burning culture has at least as much, if not more, responsibility for deforestation than the um, our imperialist masters, you know, producing charcoal and building their ships. But there you go. Anyway, thank you all very much for, for your attention. It's available um, on YouTube. You can go to the website at freecouncil.ie and it will be there. But it's also yeah. available on YouTube. It'll be up shortly when Siobhan puts it up. And people who didn't see it or if yeah. you want to see it again or if you want to see that, I really say that, you can have a look at it. Yeah.